Shaylee Peters here with you on the Rural Radio Network, coming to you from Cover Your Acres 2015 down here in Oberlin, Kansas. And uh, we're visiting now with Brownie Wilson. He is a water data manager for the Kansas Geological Survey. And obviously you're talking water with producers down here. Where you're at with it in Kansas and uh, where you're headed with it, um, why don't you start off by just talking a little bit about your presentation to begin with? Well, it's a little bit unique compared to a lot of the talks here at the Cover Your Acres conference, but we are going to talk about water. Um, obviously, we're at the Kansas Geological Survey, so we're just going to focus on the state itself. But Kansas, like a lot of the High Plains states, uh, is a little bit unique east to west, the water resources. Um, a lot of that's driven by precipitation, and a lot of that's dr driven by uh, a water supply. And western Kansas, like a lot of uh, western Nebraska and Oklahoma and Colorado, have this large water supply called the Ogallala Aquifer. And so we'll talk about you know, wh what it, what's its extent, you know, how is it used, um, how has it changed over time, where do we think it's going, and then some of the management plans that are out there in place. Okay, and as far as where it's being used right now and, and what the, uh, the rate of it is, I guess, or, or where they stand, what's your take on that? Well, uh, typically on the Kansas side, uh, uh, about 90, 95 percent of the, of the water that's used from the aquifer, is, it goes for irrigation purposes. And it's all um, through an administration process with water rights and, and whatnot. Um, typically in Kansas, we see our, our bigger groundwater declines in the Ogallala portion of what we call the High Plains Aquifer. Because that, the aquifer actually stretches into south central Kansas, uh, hydrologically connected. Uh, but that system over there is a little bit different than the, than the Ogallala. The Ogallala, typically we have, you know, lesser precipitation amounts, you know, 18 to 20 inches a year. When it does actually rain, you know, we're not in the drought conditions. Um, but in comparison to that, there's a lot more water that's, that's legally authorized to be, to be used uh, for beneficial purposes in, in the state. Um, again, irrigation is the largest one for that. And so typically this is where we see uh, the groundwater declines occurring along the western part of, of Kansas. And again, it kind of depends where you're located at. Um, typically southwest Kansas is where we see our greater declines, but there are other spots up in, through northwest Kansas and whatnot. It kind of depends where you're at. And it also kind of depends on how much water you have in supply to use to begin with, too. Okay, and I know you guys are based out of Lawrence, and so you are on that eastern end of the state where you see some more rainfall. The uh, geography is a little bit different. What's it like to come out here and kind of present to producers who are farming with uh, less water? Well, it, for me, I've, I've done this for so many years, it's, it's, it's not awkward at all. I, I actually love, like coming out in the western part of the state. Eastern Kansas, you know, like you said, has a lot more precipitation. Much of their water supplies are, are, are uh, surface water driven, lakes and streams and, and, and whatnot. They have their own set of issues with, with sedimentations and things like that. Uh, but coming out west, I mean, a lot of times, a lot of the issues are the same. Water is a very sensitive topic to a lot of people. And it, even in eastern Kansas, there's, there's always a certain quarrel about how water should be used and for what purposes. And so uh, there's no place in the state that's immune from that. Western Kansas typically, it's, it's a little bit more of a challenging because you are dealing with a, a water supply that you really can't see. And so the only way we have ideas about what it looks like are through you know, wells and certain observation points. And then we kind of have to take our best guess what's going on in, in, in between there. So there's a little bit more of a challenge that way into trying to educate how the ad aquifer behaves and how it responds with it when you can't actually physically see it. Okay, and transitioning into what you see towards the future, there's been a lot of talk around the Ogallala aquifer and supply issues. Uh, what do you see moving into the future? Well, again, we kind of have certain areas of the state that kind of covers the, the whole range. Again, we typically have our bigger groundwater declines in southwest Kansas, but at the same time, we have areas down there that have, you know, massive saturated thicknesses. There's a lot of water there to use. Um, but then we have other areas, like in uh, west central Kansas might be an example, where there wasn't a whole lot of water to begin with. A lot of that resource has been used today. And so that's kind of like a case study, what it might look like in the future. What you typically see is it's really hard to pump every last drop of water out of an aquifer system. Usually what happens is those large volume water demands that need a lot of flow and, and all summer long, like irrigation, but it could be industrial and some other applications, those are the ones that suffer first. And the way they suffer is those well yields to start to taper off. And so usually what you see is, is transitions, you know, and, and this happens in, in west central Kansas. Uh, where before, back when grandpa and grandma were farming and, and, uh, and irrigating at thousands of gallons per minute, growing corn and beans, now the flow yields are 100 gallons per minute, if that, 
and you know they've transitioned now to more of a of a of a supplemental irrigation type with with uh, with grain sorghum or maybe a wheat type of variety. So they transition. Well, and I know that's a lot of the other topics kind of are surrounded around that as far as you mentioned back in the day, maybe there was more availability. And so what are we doing now to kind of address the issue of not having that necessarily or even into the future? Uh, what sort of things are you hoping producers will take out of your presentation while you're, as we move through Cover Your Acres? Well, I think I just want to have them a everyone to have a general understanding of how the aquifer behaves. Uh, you know, there's a lot of people that think that what happens up in Colby, Kansas affects what's going on in Garden City, and that's, that's really a disconnect there. They're, they're two different aquifer systems. I mean, it, it's still the Ogallala, but, the, but they're really not connected like that. A lot of people have concerns that another state has issues in terms of their that deep groundwater, like we're talking with the Ogallala, and that's not always the case either. And so I want everybody to kind of get an understanding of how the aquifer behaves and and I think sometimes we get so much in the gloom and doom that, that what's, what's occurring out there, and that's, and yeah, there are areas that people's wells have gone to the point they're unusable, and and that is sad to see. But a lot of people are are pretty resilient, and they and they it's not an all or nothing proposition. And, and people, like I said before, transition into other environments, and we'll talk a little bit about that too during my presentation. But some of the things that are going on now to help address those long-term uh, groundwater stabilization issues. Okay, well, thank you so much. Again, joined here by Brownie Wilson. He is a water data manager with the Kansas Geological Survey, talking about the Ogallala Aquifer and some uh, future things that we could be looking at as we move into 2015 and beyond. For the Rural Radio Network, I'm Shaylee Peters.